Welcome to session two of the Marriage Builder for Wives. And last time that we were together, we talked about the importance of being his friend. I hope that you've had some really good um, thinking and and pondering around that. Um, maybe you've had a chat with the Lord about that. I hope you have. Possibly you've had a chat with your accountability partner, and maybe even your husband, about what it means to be his friend. Well, today we move on a little bit and we look at the mystery of oneness. And like last time, you're going to need your Bible. You're going to need a journal. You're going to need a pen. You'll need a teachable spirit. And eventually you'll need your accountability partner. So if you haven't got your Bible with you, a journal and a pen, push pause, go get it, and come on back. I wonder what you think of when you think of the idea of oneness in marriage. I wonder what comes to mind. How would you describe oneness? I asked Nick the other day, I said, how would we define it? How would we describe oneness? And where we ended up in our conversation was really to describe what it looks like, what, how, how we would experience it in our marriage. We talked about how we are one with our finances, how we are one in our life trajectory, how we're one in terms of we're growing together and personal growth and growth of our marriage. We parent together. We enjoy fun and pleasure together. We put our efforts together, even if we're doing different things. I might be doing the garden, Nick might be painting a fence, but it's for something that is about us together. And then finally, and so importantly, we serve the Lord together. Again, we might be doing different things in that, but we have a ministry as a couple, and every married couple does. You are called as a couple, not just as individuals, to serve the Lord and so you, this is part of your oneness. You do it together. Now, we're going to be looking into the Bible. The Bible is the place we go to for wisdom, whatever that's about. But um, in terms of our marriages, we certainly go to the Bible for our wisdom. And so we're going to be uh, looking at some things that are told us in Ephesians chapter 5. And then we're going to read from Genesis. So those are the main places we're going to today. Um, and so in the Bible, the Bible gives us a couple of ways to describe a couple of pictures of what oneness in marriage looks like. And the first one in Ephesians 5, it talks, Paul talks about um, a marriage being a little bit like a human body and where there are different parts, but part of one body. And so it would be a little bit like if we were to think of the body in different parts and we thought, well, there's the brain and the brain gives an order or a direction, a command to the stomach to digest food so that the food is available for the bodies. And, and the stomach, in turn, digests the food and sends the nutrients out, which then go up and feed the brain. Uh, and so there's the sense in which both are doing, both parts are doing what is helpful and necessary for the one. So that's one of the pictures that we can pick up on in Ephesians 5. A second picture we can pick up on in Ephesians 5 is where Paul talks about this one flesh relationship, this oneness of marriage as being a profound mystery. So if you're a little bit confused about it, that's okay. So is the Apostle Paul. So are we all. But he says that it was intended to be a picture. It was intended to be an exemplar, an image, a likeness of the relationship between Jesus and us. Our marriages are supposed to resemble the oneness that I have with the Lord, that you have with the Lord, Christ and us, us and Christ. Wonderful idea. So those are two helpful analogies from the Apostle Paul about oneness in marriage. I have my own helpful analogy. Um, so this is from just plain old Sarah. Um, but I quite like to drink a cup of coffee. And um, what, I, what I enjoy is I put my coffee beans into the bottom of the filter. And um, my favorite coffee right now, this one. So I put my coffee beans into the filter and then I put the water into the top and then I pop this filter pot onto the oven and with that addition of an outside force this this uh, thermal 
energy comes in and it causes a reaction. It, it causes the water particles to bubble around and move fast and collide against each other and crash and, and, and actually go up a little pipe and push through the coffee and make the coffee all wet and then up through the pipe taking the coffee with it and exploding out into the vessel at the top creating something completely new. Coffee beans plus water plus this outside force of thermal energy causing this this explosion creates something new something called coffee the drink it's no longer the beans it's no longer the water it's something new and oh it is mystical and it is spiritual and it is a wonderful thing that's my analogy of oneness in marriage two things coming together with an outside force and creating something quite unique and distinct from the two. And yet you can see the two in it. So where did this idea of oneness all begin in terms of marriage? Let's go back to Genesis. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Way back, second chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 21 to 25. So we know that for Adam no suitable helper was found and we looked at that idea of helper last week. So verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while he was sleeping he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. In the beginning, the very first human-to-human -human relationship was a husband-wife relationship. Marriage started with this external force. It started with an act of God. When he created, first of all, he created a woman from the side of the man, initially, therefore, making two out of one. And then he brought the woman to the man. And Adam recognized Eve as being the same as him, that she was the same kind as him, that she was human, that she was of the same stuff as him. And yet she was different. And he recognized that God was uniting him with her and they became one flesh. And what was one became two and then the two became one flesh, a new together one, a new entity. And they were naked and they felt no shame. This phrase, one flesh, they became one flesh, is both a euphemism for sexual intimacy as well as describing the entire context of, the, of this new entity. So the, the expression was in sexual intimacy. That's like the pinnacle, that's like the, the overflow, the expression of the fullness of the actual situation, which was that God had made the two one. This was not just a physical fitting together, not just a joining, but truly the beginning of something new, the becoming of something new, a new one, a together one. And so he is not her and she is not him, but together they are us. And in this oneness, there was no shame. There was no hiding. That's beautiful, isn't it? Key to the idea of oneness, as you read in these verses, a really key piece of it was the leaving of what might otherwise be rival to the relationship and, and, and specifically leaving key relationships that might otherwise become rival to the relationship of this marriage. So in Genesis 2.24 it says that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now of course Adam had no mother, he had no father and so God was establishing in principle what would happen later in practice. Subsequent marriages would involve the leaving of those other significant relationships behind. 
those relationships which had been the primary source of nurture and provision and emotional closeness. The man would leave all of these in the sense that he would now prioritise the relationship he has with his wife. He would be united with her. The older translations of the Bible use the word he would cleave to her, be united with, cleave. And so you hear this expression, leave and cleave. And what that means, this cleaving, this being united with, it means two things. First of all, it means glued together. So if you imagine two pieces of paper glued together, which is why when you try to rip them apart, when you try to separate them, there is a tearing, there is a breaking, and, and it's it's painful and it, and it hurts, and it's just not right. That's, that's what that's all about. There's a glued together, cleave, united with. But it also means pursue hard after. United with means pursue hard hard after. The very best marriages are marriages where husbands and wives pursue hard after each other right throughout the length and breadth of their marriage. I wonder, do you think that you have any concept at all of just how precious your marriage is to God? Do you have any idea of how jealously he guards your marriage? Do you have a clue about how invested God is in your marriage? Jesus quoted from these verses in Genesis 2 that we've just read. And, and you can find that in Matthew 19. He quotes from these verses and then he also adds to them and so he says so they, they are no longer two but one flesh and then he says this this is what he adds therefore what God has joined together God that outside force that causes these two distinct things to become one what God has joined together let no one separate that's not just what the priest or the pastor says at a wedding that's what Jesus says about marriage. Jesus makes the point that this oneness established by God is settled in heaven. God has done it and he's fully invested in it. And so no human should cause a separation, should cause a division between a husband and a wife. No wedge, no drifting apart, no breaking away, no hiding. When you stood at the altar, or wherever it was that you were when you got married, and you said, I do, or I will, and the pronouncement was made, I now pronounce you husband and wife, you became one with your husband, together one. You chose it. God did it. You were married completely. And then from that moment, ever since, until one or other of you dies, you will spend the rest of your life working out how to be one, how to be married, what this, this profound mysteriousness of oneness. Two individuals together one, joined by God, glued together, pursuing hard after each other with nothing hidden, no shame, Two parts of one body working together for the whole, reflecting the spiritual reality of Christ in us, us in Christ, oneness, a mystery of beauty and marvel, a heavenly design. The rest of our lives, working it out. Well, of course, you could go on in Genesis. You could just go on to the very next chapter. You could read chapter 3, and then you could continue reading on just to discover what happened in that first marriage and every marriage since, since sin entered into the world. And you could look at your own marriage too. You don't have to look very far to see the impact of sin on our marriages. And the reality is, it's a bit like what Princess Diana famously said in her interview about the breakdown in her marriage with Prince Charles and speaking about her rival, Camilla, when she said these words, there were three of us in the marriage. There are three of you 
in your marriage, in any marriage. There is me, there is he, your husband, and there is us. When you're in a fight, and when you're all about you, you tend to stand in the corner entitled me. And he tends to stand in the corner entitled he. And what happens is you fire shots across at each other. But what we actually need to do is we need to walk away from our corners and we need to choose to stand together in the space in the middle which is called us. Because when we're firing bullets across at the other person, we're inflicting pain and we are breaking down the us. We need to fight together for us. And even if the other person isn't fighting for us, we need to make the choice to fight for us. You see, the battle is not actually between the two of you. The battle is for your marriage. The battle is not against the other person. It is for oneness. It might feel like it's a battle between the two of you, but that's just a diversion. That's just to, to get you off the game. That's just to take your eye off the true enemy. The battle is not against him, your husband. The battle is for your marriage. To win over your husband is to lose in your marriage. To win in your marriage requires huge, immense, incredible humility many, many, many times over. Jesus said, don't separate. Well, let's be real. There's a whole lot of separating well before there's a formal legal separation. So although that may be that, that final separation, we need to become more and more aware of the things that we do and say and think of our patterns of behaving that actually are separating us. Those things that, that put a wedge between us, those things that, that build walls between us, those things where we, ways that we pull away from each other and we need to make those necessary changes. We need to, to choose to walk away from our corners and, and, and stop fighting from there and come together and, and instead of fighting for self, fight for oneness in our marriages. Before we move on to finish today, you know, the greatest goal in life is to worship the Lord. There's nothing greater. And I just cannot finish without us considering together how wonderful He is. You see, I've discovered something. The more in love I am with Jesus, the more in love I am with Nick. The more in love I am with Jesus, the more I'm able to fight for oneness in my marriage. So let me encourage your soul with this. Did you realize that we, the church, the bride of Christ, we were taken from his wounded side? Did you realize that our relationship with him began with his pain, began with his sacrifice, began with loss. Did you realize that it began with an act of the Father? Did you realize that Jesus left the Father in order to be united with us, to pursue us hard? Did you know that one day, He's going to leave his father again and he's going to come in order to be united with his bride. And that he has gifted us a lifetime in which to learn how to be his bride, how to be this new together one with him. Isn't that wonderful? And all that we learn there, we can then take into our marriages. He's the power in our marriages. We're going to talk more about that next time when we look at how to enact the three-strand cord. It's going to be good. 
So in the sessions ahead of us, the remaining six sessions, everything that we talk about will be wisdom uh, that, that about how we can actively pursue friendship and oneness and so bring, bring blessing into our marriage relationships. Before next week though, here are three reflection questions for you to jot down in your journal and do a little bit of work on. The first one is, as you think back on the past week, or you can go further back if you want, what examples do you have of, of where you have pulled away from rather than actively pursued your husband? And just write down those examples. The second question, next time you have the choice to either stand and fight in your corner or walk away from your corner, choose to walk away. <laughs> Go into the middle, into the us. Now the next time you do that, and you make that good choice, make a note, write the story down and, and write down what resulted from that. Write down all that you can think of. What was the story of you making that choice? And share that with your accountability partner. And then the third one is, make a list of the ways that you could lean into oneness, that you could increase oneness, lean into oneness. Here's some examples I thought of. Um, praying together, reading the Bible together, laughing together, doing something fun together, watching a movie, reading a book together, playing cards together, learning something together, making love together, exercising together, going out on a walk together, whatever it is. What can you do to build that oneness? Make a list. So with all of those three things, would you write those things down? Would you talk to Jesus about those things? Would you talk with your accountability partner about those things? And if you can, have a chat to your husband about them and share what you've learned today. I'm going to pray for you now before we go. Father, we worship you. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Saviour, we praise you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I lift up my sisters to you. And Father, I pray that they will actively pursue oneness in their marriages. In the places where it's hard, Lord, would you just minister your truth, your light, your power, your perseverance. Father, in the places where there are stuck patterns that are against oneness, show us, Lord, and give us hearts after you. Bless these marriages, Lord, as we put into place these spiritual principles, the wisdom from your word that you've given us to build our marriages. Lord, we bless you. We love you. I pray that each one of my sisters here would fall more in love with you, Lord Jesus. And so fall more and more in love with their husbands. So we give this, this truth to you, Lord, and we ask you to ignite it in us and change us for your glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next time. Have a really amazing week. Bye.